why, Nate? Well, thank you, Julian. Uh, Fred, uh, going to Perth without the three star midfielders, but I did look something up and you beat them over there without Wells and Swallow last year. I mean, does that mean anything and the win in general over there mean anything? Uh, look, in terms of the more focused on the players who are in, I mean, um, you know, we, we've, we pride ourselves on our depth and, you know, every team's going to miss players, you know, at various stages throughout the year and, you know, the, we... Last year we, we won over there without our um, reigning best and fairest three years running because Scott Thompson was the other one who didn't play. So I think that you know both teams will probably have a turnover of seven or eight players in terms of the 22 that will line up for their respective sides on Saturday night. So you know it's about the players who are there. We're really confident in the 22 we can put forward. How different are they though? I mean they they've looked to have improved a lot. How highly do you rate them this year? Oh, they're seven and zero for a reason. I mean, they're they're uh, a very good side, very well drilled, and and they're all on the same page. So it presents a, a significant challenge for us, but but a challenge that we really welcome. But how do you stop Nat Fife at the moment? He's obviously probably arguably the best player in the competition at the moment. Yeah, well, we've got some pretty good midfielders as well, so who are in good form, and um, you know we'll just take him on. I mean, he's a, clearly we've got a lot of respect for him as everyone does, but um, you know he's sometimes the the mystique can, can build to a point where, where people think he's unstoppable and you know, he's a really good player, but every team's got really good players. And Would you likely have a person run with him or let him let him run himself? No, he'll have an opponent. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 will he have an opponent that'll be specifically going with him for the game? Or? Oh, they're, they're all things we've got to work out. I mean, I, I've, I've said before with other teams that, you know, that have got really good individuals that if you, if you focus purely on them, yep. you take your eye off Monday. And I think that's disrespectful to Monday. Um, you know, I think it's disrespectful to Stephen Hill and Michael Barlow and, and Lockie Neal and Daniel Pearce. And, you know, they've got a, a really solid midfield. So, and they've got um, you know, a solid list and a solid team. So you know, that, that presents a challenge for us, but one we welcome. What about Waite and Ben Brown for this week? Yeah, Waite should be fine. I don't, we don't have any um, uh, concerns there. Um, you know, it's pretty stock standard these days to, to, to scan everything. Um, so we're really cautious and we check most things. But uh, Wadey should be fine. Ben Brown's been cleared of structural damage, but you know, we'll have to assess his function um, more than, I suspect, getting medical clearance. And Lockie Hanson, Brad, will he, did he pull up okay? Yeah, he's fine. No problem at all. Where does the captaincy go to in Swallow's absence? Sorry, madam. Who does the captaincy go to this week? Got a stand in sorted? Now, Drew Petrie um, will be our is our vice captain and, and, and will stand in. Jack Zebel um, is is also our vice captain, but but Drew will, will toss the coin and, and um, you know our leadership group will take over. But yeah, you know, we've got good experience in that last year with Andrew Swallow missing a significant part of the year with his Achilles. Just on his absence, uh, Brad, are you confident that's only a one or two week at, at most type of injury? That, that's been the advice provided to us. Um, um, yeah, he was he was. I spoke to him Monday night after surgery, and he was in really good spirits. Um, you know, he's really confident that it'll be a quick turnaround. But I mean, we'll be we'll be guided by the surgeons, and you know, now that it's been surgically fixed, you know, there's no no concern with it. Uh, further complications. It's more just how he can function. Have you, with uh, Lindsay Thomas, obviously you, you addressed that last week. Do you, have you spoken about it with Lindsay internally, so he doesn't change the way? Um, that he goes about it now. Yeah, I, I have, Glenn. I think that's important. I, I, we have no issue with um, with the way uh, Lindsay's playing. Um, in fact, I think Lindsay's improved over the last six years in terms of holding his feet in the contest. Uh, we don't want him um, playing for free kicks as such, but we do want him challenging the tackler. And if the if the tackler um, doesn't employ the correct technique and and Lindsay's able to draw a high free kick, well, so be it. And we'll continue to get our players to challenge the opposition tacklers. Uh, and that's well within the rules. And you now, as for the spirit of the game, the spirit of the game always has been winning the ball in a contest. And Lindsay does that really well. And the spirit of the game, to me, is the onus being on the tackler laying a correct tackle. Taking Lin no, you go. No, you go, mate. Taking Lindsay uh, completely out of it. Um, do you fundamentally agree that players that lowering themselves that should still be paid a free kick? I think it makes it really difficult for the umpires to adjudicate whether um, a player's lowered his knees or whether he shrugged his shoulders. I mean the. The, the umpires have made it really clear to us that, that um, you know, if the tackle goes high, um, provided that player doesn't duck his head into the contact. And I think that's the really contentious one. That's the one that, that I wholeheartedly agree with. If a, if a player ducks his head and drives his head forward into the tackler, you know, that's a really dangerous practice and, and all players should be discouraged from doing that and the rules should, should you know, support the tackler in that.
in that situation. But that, that is the only situation. I mean, the, the onus has always been on the tackler to lay a correct tackle. And you know, I think the, the ball carrier will, will certainly continue to, to challenge the tackler, and I'm in support of that. So are you satisfied with the current interpretations as they stand, or if the umpiring department came to you mid-season and consulted, would you recommend some alterations be made? No, I mean, they're charged with the, with the responsibility of making the rules, and we're charged with the responsibility of playing to them. So um, to answer your question, if I was asked um, any advice, I'd be saying do everything you can to discourage the ball carrier from ducking his head and driving into tackles because, you know, we're... we're, we're Flirting with disaster if that continues. But as for as for challenging the tackler in a in a high uh, tackle situation, you know, everyone does it, and it just so happens there are some who are better than others. As, an, as a coach, with telling your players how to tackle, obviously you want to pin the arm so they can't get the handball free. Are there players like Chapman and Selwood where you would actually say? just go for the hips because otherwise you're going to give away a free kick? Like, would you ever advise differently on certain players and how to tackle them? Yeah, we, we do our research as every other club does, I suspect. And, you know, we, we uh, look at how different players employ different techniques and we've got a different tackling technique to counter that. And that just goes back to, again, the onus being on the tackler. Lee Adams is apparently eyeing a return to football. Um, Jeff Walsh said, what can you tell us? Um, well, I can tell you that, that we're, we're really keen for him to, um, to, to drive this process and uh, we certainly put no pressure on him. I mean, the, the number one uh, outcome that we want here is for, for Patch to have a, you know, a, a, a really healthy life going forward. Um, and I think the most important thing for me is being medically cleared by, by all the specialists. Um, but the most important thing is that he is uh, in a really good um, headspace to go and and accept contact again because we do play a contact sport and, and Patch accepts that and you know, we'll, we'll start to transition him into contact drills or training and see how he handles that and see how he recovers and then when he's ready to play he'll let us know Brad, but certainly not before that. Brad, is there any update out of the business from Hobart a couple of weeks ago? Have you heard anything? No, unfortunately I haven't. Um, you know, I've made it um, really clear to Tasmanian authorities that I'm really keen to speak to them. Um, I've made myself available at any, any time to speak to them. So unfortunately that hasn't uh, occurred yet because I'd really like to, as I said last week, put some facts in the story. Have they given a reason for the holder? No, I've heard nothing. So, um, But you know, I'll just get on with the job and when they contact me when they've got time, that'll be good. Just Brad, how frustrating the ongoing injuries of Taylor Garner and Kieran Harperboone? Oh, they have because they're valuable players. They add great speed uh, to our list. But, but Taylor Garner's, um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic he's going to play in the next two weeks. So he'll, he'll train fully today and it's just a matter of getting the conditioning uh, back into him. He's medically clear, clear to play, but we want him um, uh, back playing after he's done a significant block of work. And Kieran Harper's probably going to start training again on Friday. So you know, cautiously optimistic they'll be back really soon. What have you made of Frio's fast starts yet slow finishes this year? Uh, not much, just that, that it's, they play so well so early that it's impossible to maintain that high standard for four quarters. So, um, you know, we're going to have to be on our game right from the start because they certainly have blown most opposition away early. Just on five, do you think he's the number one player now? Oh, I'm not. I, I'll, let the, I'll let you guys do all the rankings. Um, you know, I think he's a, he's a quality player. You know, he's, um, you know, we've respected him for a long time. But, uh, uh, look, as I said earlier in the press conference, um, you know, if we... Overplay Fife, and I understand that he's a great player, and, and everyone is rightfully talking highly of him. But don't disrespect David Mundy and Stephen Hill and Lockie Neal and all those guys. They're a very good midfield, and there's no point having a superstar midfield when you don't have, or a superstar midfielder that doesn't have a good midfield around him. And Fremantle have got that. McFarlane's due in for Fremantle, and he's had the edge on Petrie in recent years. How are you viewing that matchup? Uh, edge. I thought Drew did pretty well last year um, when we won. Uh, so, um, you know, they're both a year older. Um, they'll both look forward to the challenge, I'm sure. But, um, you know, we, we definitely don't rely on Drew Petrie to, to win a game of footy, just like we don't rely on Ben Brown or Andrew Swallow or Jared White. You know, we, we function as an offensive unit and it'll be the performance of that unit that gets the job done, not just uh, Drew himself.